Great. Thank you, uh, Jonathan, for that kind introduction. And thank you to the Congress organizers for giving us an opportunity again um, to talk about VIV and um, the pipeline that we have. My disclosure, as Jonathan said, I am a full-time employee of VIV Healthcare. If I can get this to progress. Um, and hopefully you all are familiar with, with VIV, but for those of you um, who are not, um, we're a specialty company, 100% focused on HIV. And our mission is simple. It's to leave no one living with HIV behind. And we take that mission to heart and um, really use that to ground us in, in everything that we do from, from a research and development and um, corporate perspective. So I'm gonna start this talk first just reminding us of the incredible progress that's been made collectively. Um, you know, I think one of the beauties of HIV is from the beginning, it's been a really strong partnership between academia, industry, the community, everyone really leaning in to play their part um, to really combat um, this infection. And I wanna reflect a bit on how far we've come, but also to remind us that even though we've made great progress, there's still 38 million people in the world living with HIV. There's still roughly 1.7 million new infections every year. Um, and that translates to about 4,000 a day. So while we have the privilege to sit here in Rome for three days talking to each other about this, uh, during our time here, over 12,000 people in the world um, have been infected with HIV. So there is still clearly more work to be done. So I think it's important to reflect on the journey we've been on and the progress that we've made, and thankfully, because of innovations, you know, people living with HIV now can expect to have essentially normal life expectancy equivalent to that of uh, those in the general population. And the standard of care we have for HIV is now uh, really, really efficacious. The bar is high, right? So if you look at the medicines that are in the guidelines, for the most part, they're having viral suppression rates of over 90%. So it's been incredible progress, but um, we have a high bar and we're not yet done. Recent innovations have seen two drug regimens make their way into the guidelines now in naive and um, switch patients. And we have long-acting injectables that are also on the market. And the first ever long-acting uh, regimen is now guideline recommended as well. That being said, um, even today, roughly two-thirds of people living with HIV still worry about the long-term impact of their medications, right? Thankfully, now people can live long lives with HIV, but what that means is they're now on medicines for, for decades, and patients do worry about those long-term side effects. And quality of life for people living with HIV still is not equal compared to those who are not living with HIV. So it's lower in people living with HIV, and we know that decreases as disease progresses. So there's still a lot of work to do We've talked over these three days about the stigma that still persists and, and still has significant challenges to overcome. And we continue to have new diagnoses, as I mentioned, even in Western settings, even in high income settings. Um, we know people aren't getting tested, diagnosed, and linked to care. So there's definitely more work to do. So today, thankfully, we do have options. And I think the last session really um, brought that to life, right? Daniel, uh, Daryl, and others were really talking about the importance of options for patients because people living with HIV are diverse, right? Every single one is unique. They have their own individual experiences. They'll have their own preferences about what's best for them. So it's critically important that we continue to bring options to patients because we definitely do not believe that one size fits all. We believe people need to be empowered and have options to choose based on what's best for them. We're strong believers in having broad access, to and we need to continue to develop effective models to make sure that people who can benefit from HIV medications can access them. We have a long-standing history in this space, uh, working with Medicines Patent Pool and generic partners um, on dolutegravir, and the benefits of that mean that now 22 million people living with HIV on ART are now on a dolutegravir-based regimen around the world, primarily through TLD, uh, thanks to the generic partnerships that we've, that we've enabled. 
And then finally, from prevention perspective, we have prevention methods in our hands today, but there's clearly more work to do. Again, we've talked about that during this conference. We need to continue to lean into prevention, make sure all those people who can really benefit from HIV prevention um, are aware of it, are informed, know what options are available, and have access to that so they can benefit from PrEP. So from a Aviv perspective, what do we see as the future? We think we need uh, options that continue to increase the dosing interval. What we hear from patients uh, is the longer the better, right? So we now have um, a long-acting regimen that allows people uh, two monthly dosing for their regimen. It's a big uh, way forward, but we're hearing from patients that they want even longer dosing durations, and we believe long-acting and ultra-long-acting medicines are the future um, of HIV. We need to continue to develop new mechanisms of action, right? HIV is smart. It's still a pretty formidable foe, so we have to continue to bring new mechanisms of action um, to continue to stay ahead of it. We're also exploring self-administration. So currently, our long-acting regimen is physician-administered or clinic-administered. And we've heard from patients that some would prefer to administer this at home. Not everyone, as we've talked about. Some people do not want any type of HIV medication in their home. Um, so that's why options are important. But for many people, they would like to explore self-administration. So we're actively looking at that as well. And again, focusing on other options to meet individual needs. So now, specifically, uh, I'm going to talk about our pipeline and our portfolio. And for those of you who have heard these talks before, you should be familiar with this slide. Uh, we call it the swoosh. <laughs> but I love this slide because it really shows um, the legacy of our company, how we've been in this field, been in HIV from the beginning, and, and the accomplishments that we've made, but also highlights um, where we're going. So if you just start on, on the left-hand side of the slide for a minute, uh, our company, or, or legacy companies, because we are a joint venture, have been in the HIV space from the beginning. Um, we were the first company to get approval for an HIV treatment regimen, being AZT. And we also continued to innovate and had the first ever fixed dose combination with Combivir. When the integrase inhibitor came around, uh, we had the first second generation integrase inhibitor in dolutegravir and had um, strong legacy in that space. And then we've had the first approved two drug regimens that are all dolutegravir based and the first complete long acting treatment regimen in cabrolpivirine. And we've talked about that quite a bit um, during this session. We also had the first attachment inhibitor for highly treatment experienced patients with Fostemzivir that launched several years ago. So we've had a really strong track record of continuing to deliver innovation for people living with HIV. And then the first ever long acting injectable uh, for PrEP in, in Apertude, which was approved at the end of 21. We also have continued to look at new options in, in pediatrics, and I'm gonna talk about this in more detail in a minute. Um, definitely a topic that's near and dear to my heart, but we do believe, um, aligned to our mission, that everyone needs to be able to access HIV medications, and that includes the youngest of children. And they still do not have the same treatment options that adults do. And then if you move to the right-hand side of the slide, it's mainly what we're going to be talking about today is pipelines. So what's, what's to come if you look at the gray box? We're going to be focusing on um, two new profiles as part of our pipeline ultra-long-acting medications and self-administration. And under that broader umbrella, we have several new molecules that are in um, early phase clinical development now that we think can help achieve um, those profiles. So we're going to be um, continuing to work in the integrase space. We do believe integrase um, should be at the core of, of treatment regimens. We have some capsid inhibitors, maturation inhibitor, and broadly neutralizing antibodies. So we're going to dig into that in a bit more detail in a moment. And then finally, the top part of the arrow is really important here because ultimately we all are focused on remission and cure. I think we can agree that's the holy grail in, in the HIV space, and we're very much committed to that as well. Uh, for the interest of today and timing, I'm not going to talk about our cure efforts, but just to say we're actively engaged in um, cure research as well. So let's just focus a little bit on that, that gray box. Here's just a representation that shows 
that we really are looking at um, new medicines in our pipeline really across the life cycle of HIV. So starting on the left-hand slide, you know, our, our broadly neutralizing antibody N6LS um, acts through binding infusion. Moving over, capsid um, has multiple mechanisms of action, but one of them is, is in the early phase in terms of nuclear entry and uncoding. Then in terms of integration, we are exploring um, new formulations of cabotegravir, um, doing multiple different explorations there, trying to see if we can get cabotegravir to be longer acting or, or a product that could be self-administered. We also have a third generation integrase inhibitor that's in development. This um, comes from our partner company, Shianogi. We've had a long-standing relationship with them um, through our partnership with them is where dalutegravir and cabotegravir came. They now have another uh, third generation INSTI, which we call V8184, um, that we're exploring. And again, moving through the life cycle, as I said, capsid could work late, and then we have maturation inhibitor working in the final stages of life cycle. So really excited, thinking through uh, products that could work really across the life cycle of HIV. So this gives you a sense of uh, where we are in, in our development efforts with all of these new programs. Most of them are in phase one, and um, other than broadly neutralizing antibody, which is kicking off phase 2B um, later this year. And really what this shows is we have multiple pathways that we believe can get us to ultra-long acting um, and potentially get us to self-administration for some of these as well. So, you know, if you think about this in the various combinations, we uh, believe we have multiple shots on goal um, to deliver effective new therapies moving forward. So just a little bit about uh, the next generation integrase inhibitor. So VH184, um, as I mentioned, is a third generation integrase inhibitor, has a high genetic barrier, and importantly, its resistance profile does look to be distinct from dalutegravir and cabotegravir. It does have a long half-life, so we're hopeful um, it could be developed as an ultra-long-acting medicine. Um, it's in first time in human now, so uh, I can't share any specific data about it, but uh, stay tuned next year. Uh, as, as that data comes forward from the trial, uh, you all will be uh, seeing it at that time. And then for the new formulations of cabotegravir, you know, cabotegravir is proven uh, as an efficacious registered medicine that's long-acting. So again, it's really just looking at how can we uh, work with the formulation to get it to be even longer-acting and have a tolerability profile that would enable self-administration subcutaneous use, essentially. So this is the only uh, data slide that I'm, I'm going to show. Hopefully you all have seen this. This is the results from the Banner study. So Banner was our proof of concept 2A study for N6LS that was presented at Glasgow last year and was um, showing essentially two uh, single doses of N6LS in HIV therapy-naive patients, treatment-naive patients. And what you can see is, um, regardless of dose, there was a low dose and a high dose, four milligrams per kilogram and 40 milligrams per kilogram. But regardless of dose, um, we saw good antiviral activity. The median range um, of the viral load drop was about 1.72 in, in the high dose arm uh, that occurred roughly two weeks after administration. And in general, it was well tolerated. There were um, adverse events, uh, but they were mild to moderate, no grade three uh, adverse events uh, or serious adverse events. And all the drug-related AEs and the ISRs were grade one. So we're quite excited about N6LS and, and the potential um, that it could have in this space. And again, it's moving into phase 2B um, this year. So I also want to um, focus a bit on a collaboration that we announced um, last year with Halozyme. So Halozyme is a company that has what's called Enhance as a drug delivery technology. And, and this, we really believe, will enable ultra-long-acting regimens. So what is Enhance? Enhance is um, essentially a hyaluronidase. Uh, we affectionately call it PH20. It's easier to say. And what it does is it enables, essentially, um, expansion of the subcutaneous space so you can deliver larger volumes of product uh, in a way that's uh, typically better tolerated because it breaks down the hyaluronin that is there. 
So this technology allows for rapid delivery of high dose, large volume, subcutaneous um, products. We believe this could potentially help reduce the burden of injectable drugs. Um, they all are gonna have ISRs, they're injectable medications, but if there's something that we can do that can make those ISRs um, minimal and better tolerated, we believe that's important. So again, because of that, and because potentially then you can deliver larger drug volumes, larger drug loads, we believe this could take our medicines to ultra long acting. So we have an exclusive license with Halozyme for four different pipeline products. And the poster is just showing that um, data on this was also presented showing N6LS was tolerated um, when given with or without um, pH 20 in a proof of concept phase one trial. So again, watch this space. So I'm going to pause for a minute uh, on this slide. I think many of you know I'm a pediatric infectious disease clinician. Um, so pediatrics is really my passion. And um, I've seen firsthand the challenges that children, their caregivers, their parents go through um, trying to get multiple um, poorly tasting medications <laughs> into them um, to suppress their virus. So there are still nearly 1.7 million children under the age of 14 globally living with HIV. And sadly, only roughly half were receiving any kind of ART. So our company has a huge focus in pediatrics, and it's not only developing uh, dosing for pediatrics, which is important, but we're really focused on developing pediatric-friendly formulations, so formulations that children will take that are palatable. And, and this shows you all the different activities we have happening in the pediatric space, multiple trials in Tivike. Um, or dolly we now have that dose down to the youngest of children, down to neonates, in a very pediatric-friendly formulation. It's a dispersible tablet, can be reconstituted in less than a teaspoon of water, and it's strawberry-flavored. And we did palatability studies and showed that children actually did take it and, and found it palatable, and, and the parents found it easy to administer. I think one of the things I'm most excited about is we now have pediatric Triamex. So again, the first ever fixed dose combination for the youngest of children. It's a dispersible tablet, same notion. You can disperse it in water um, and administer it so the child can really just be taking one dose of, of medicine and getting a complete regimen. And then we're continuing to explore our marketed products, uh, Devado, Deluca, Cabral, Piverine, um, as well um, down to young children. In terms of CAB prevention, um, thankfully, the partnership we have with HPTN 083 and 084 included adolescent sub-studies. So the data that came from those sub-studies enabled us to get labeling down to teenagers, uh, 35 kgs and above, as part of the initial market application. Um, and, and you know, I think from the beginning now, we will have cabotegravir for prevention labeled down to adolescents. And then we're just kicking off uh, a pediatric study. I know some of you might be, be working on it in this room called SHIELD, um, looking at Recobia, Fostem Severe, and children as well. I think the other thing that comes through this slide is not only the incredible breadth of work that we're doing in pediatrics, but the partnerships that it takes to do this. So if you look at this slide, all of the studies we're doing in partnership with IMPACT, PENTA, um, and, and other um, research um, bodies, and that's critically important. So just a word on prevention. Um, we believe in enabling broad access, as I spoke to before, and we're collaborating right now to really enable, um, really, people in resource-limiting settings can access long-acting PrEP. So just to remind people, the first approval for Apertude was in the US. FDA approved it in December of 2021. Um, we worked very quickly to file multiple registrations in, in many African countries um, right around the same time we filed in, in the U.S. And in July of 22, we were able to announce our partnership with Medicines Patent Pool. So we signed a voluntary license agreement um, for patients receiving Cab LA for PrEP that would enable access in 90 countries. This is um, really being done in massive partnership um, through a coalition um, that includes AVAC, Bill and Melinda Gates, Children's Investment Fund, Med Access, Unitate, et cetera. So really, again, it takes a community, it takes a village to do this. Um, but we're really excited about the potential of this collaboration and what it could deliver. 
And then in March of this year, the MPP did successfully sign sublicenses to produce generic um, long-acting cabotegravir for HIV preps. That was the big first step in terms of identifying those generic manufacturers that can um, get started on this path. We believe it's still several years before we will have generic versions on the market, but we're really excited about the progress that's been made because we think these licenses will enable potentially millions of people living with HIV in, in those parts of the world that are most impacted by it to access this new innovative preventive medicine through low-cost generics. So in summary, um, here's where we believe the future is. The future is definitely in long-acting treatment and really need to focus on options and different mechanisms of action and different methods of drug delivery. We really need to focus on improved quality of life and we think long-acting therapies are a big driver of doing just that. And again, some of those data that were presented earlier this year from Solar and others I think really speak to the role that long acting can play in terms of liberating people um, from that daily reminder of, of HIV. And then again, big focus continued on prevention and cure, and even in the prevention space looking for, through these new formulations of cabotegravir, can we get a prevention option that's even longer acting um, than every two months. Um, so with that, um, I will stop and just say thank you very much uh, for your time and happy to take any questions. Thank you.